When The Rings of Power came out, we all knew there were going to be a mixture of episodes that might have the same effect as your average medication. Some would put you to sleep faster than a drinking contest with NyQuil. Others would give you heartburn watching the perversion of perhaps the greatest work of literary fiction be corrupted for political and cultural reasons in the same way Melkor twisted the elves into orcs. And then there's episodes like this one that make me wish that God would do to Hollywood what Iluvatar will eventually do to Numenor. Buckle up, because this one's gonna be a doozy. But first, if you want to see more, then subscribe to join my kingdom so you don't miss a new video. Continuing where we left off, Karen Sue and Abercrombie were found adrift at sea and brought back to Numenor. Once there, Elendil introduces the unlikely pair to the nobles and royalty of Numenor, including Queen Muriel and her advisor Farazhan. And without skipping a beat, Karen Sue promptly threatens them because they won't just give her what she demands so that she can return to Middle-earth. You know, because teaching young women that you can threaten the lives of others and get your way has caused no problems for anyone. Anyway, once again, we are denied Karen Sue's death because fucking Abercrombie decides to save her ass by rolling a nat 20 on his charisma check, convincing the royalty to give them a few days rest and to reconsider helping them to return to Middle-earth. During this time, Elendil is ordered to watch Karen Sue, who is currently assassins creating her way around Numenor. She is in search of a boat, and despite having no clue where she is or could be, Elendil appears around the corner, and this nasty bitch has the audacity to talk down to him with the line, Who is this mortal who speaks as though he knows me? I'll get to that one later. Anyway, so Elendil is brushed off like a man under six foot until he speaks a little elvish, and all of a sudden, Karen Sue starts fawning over him and his usefulness like the schoolgirls when Dexter started speaking French. Elendil mentions they have a hall of Wikipedia, and Karen Sue immediately rushes off with Elendil to do an internet. And lo and behold, there is information on the mysterious symbol that we've seen concluding that everyone's suspicions were correct. It just means go to Mordor. Meanwhile, Abercrombie gets himself into trouble, pickpocketing a dude, then getting into a fight with him and his friends. Abercrombie beats the shit out of these people like a red-headed snow troll in an elven family, and is promptly thrown in prison where Karen Sue reveals she knows Abercrombie is of royal descent. While much of this happens, we catch back up with the Fresh Prince of Noldor, who's been captured by the orcs along with many of the villagers from Hordern, and apparently all of the elves from his outpost. How? Not a fucking clue. Must have been enticed by a trail of candy under a box like Peter and Brian were catching James Woods. Anyway, the orcs are digging a trail from somewhere to who the hell knows, and are using slave labor to get there. After a little bit of pushback and the elf friend from the first episode dying, the fresh prince of Noldor and the others rise up against their captors, who release the war. A ravenous, unstoppable monster as large as a horse is probably what you thought it would be. Not here. This thing looks like the stoned fox. And I didn't know which to laugh at harder, the retarded dog with mange or the two elves doing whirly-twirly moves and promptly getting mulched by the fucking thing. Either way, my sides were hurting like I was watching Dave Chappelle live. Of course, this uprising is short-lived, with the elves fighting these orcs in broad daylight, getting utterly decimated, with presumably only the Fresh Prince of Noldor left and being saved just in the nick of time to be brought before the orc leader, Adar. And I'm pretty sure he's an elf. Lastly, we return to the Harfoots, preparing for their migration to the Great Valley or some shit. The first scene we see them chanting, I'll paraphrase, Nobody goes off trail, and no one walks alone. Which is a neat little buddy system motto that makes total sense. Except the very next shot, our Nori's parents concerned they'll fall behind. But we'll get to that one later, too. Anyway, so the festivities begin, and the leader, Sadak Burroughs, begins reading from the Book of Memories. All of those who were killed, or well, left behind. Nori had snatched a page from Burroughs' book, looking like it's filled with Sheikah constellations from Breath of the Wild, and she put the page down ahead of the festivities. Unbeknownst to her, the stranger arrived and, recognizing the images, sits next to a fire to read the paper. A fire that he practically puts the paper in and torches it, causing him to freak out, crash the festival, and be discovered. This gets Nori and her family in trouble, and they're told they can still join the caravan, but at the back. Many characters are absent for pacing reasons, which is a good decision, because this episode is already bloated like Rosie O'Donnell, and the showrunners have proven they have the balance of a drunken waiter. I wasn't kidding when I said a whole slew of characters would be introduced with Numenor alone, having almost as many as we've already come to know. Queen Muriel, Farazan, Elendil, Isildur, the orc leader Adar, and possibly still more to come. Soon, there may be enough people to list as a post-episode poke rap. On top of all of this, many of the same problems 
problems from the previous episodes are occurring here, like the pacing being cold molasses with so little happening in their own locations even with the attempts to spice up the show. First off, there is almost Matrix levels of slow motion in this episode, like when Karen Sue is riding a horse and finally smiles. Even though she looks like a henchman for the Joker, this shot is slowed down so much you could visibly see Protons taking a coffee break. Some of the slow motion is in support of the action as well, which goes over about as well as a bar fight. I mentioned Whirly Twirly moves are the reason for some of these characters in this episode getting eviscerated by the Stone Fox. And I have the same reaction to fight choreographers who put unnecessary weapon spinning in their movies as those who tell extras with guns to run into the melee range of their target. You're gonna die tired. And this is exactly exactly one of those moments. The first elf that does all of this spinning is killed in the middle of that stupid trick, and the collective facepalm in the room could have been felt across the world. And once again, we get more crouching elf hidden budget wire stunts, though at least they aren't as overtly terrible as Karen Sue being hoisted by a high school crew. Now what I really want to sink my teeth into are the characters here, because my Iluvatar, this is a banquet of failure and I've been fasting. First and foremost, the Numenorians. This is their introductory episodes, so they haven't done much, but the small things give them away. Instead of being unified over the shared victory of Morgoth in the past, the Numenorians cut off all relations and trade with the elves because they... also lost forces in the war? That is Karen Sue levels of pettiness, so much so that interactions with elves like Elendil bringing Abercrombie and Bitch back to Numenor is even considered treason. Elendil pulls an excuse out of his ass to save his ass, lest he be swimming with the extras from the last episode. And I know a lot of people are enamored with Elendil, but honestly, he hasn't done much? I mean, he's an honest soldier and a strict father, sure, but like the rest of most of the cast, he's just alright and hasn't had time to blossom. Then there are the elves. I'm not saying these people should be as known a fighter as the Mormigil, but my Iluvatar, they are as incompetent as politicians. First off, I don't care how many orcs there are, the elves had a defensible tower with arrows and yet were captured? You morons had the high ground and you lost? It's like the state of Texas losing to zombies, what the fuck were you doing? This handful of elves gets thrashed by a stray dog with rabies and orcs that burn in the sun like the Irish on the beach of Florida. And that's played fast and loose with as well. In some shots, orcs have a little sun on them and they start to burn, while other scenes, their faces are completely exposed to the light, and they're fine. With all the money behind this project, one would hope the writers would have bought a fucking thesaurus to find out what consistency means. But I guess they must have thought you could only find a thesaurus in a museum. It ain't over yet, folks. Now we move on to the Harfoots. They have this festivity before migrating to their next area, and the chant, as I mentioned before, is totally fine on the surface. Nobody goes off trail, and no one walks alone. There should be no disagreement there. These people are supposed to be two to three foot tall, a chicken to us is a choke about of them, and in the Book of Memories, one of their fallen was stung to death by bees. How horrifying that must have been to die alone, stung by thousands of these fucking things, and they're laughing about it? Oh, let's not forget that Nori is found out to have been hiding the stranger. Not only is her dad's leg injured, but her family is voted to go to the back of the bus, I mean caravan. So much for that whole stick together chant, you'd sooner leave people who have done nothing wrong behind by simply walking faster than them than actually help those in need. Seriously, when the migration does occur, there are multiple extras just walking alongside carrying nothing. Why not offer some help to the less able? Oh, we've lived this way for thousands of years. So you're telling me your way of life is to leave people behind at the first sign of trouble? And your statement contradicts everything from five minutes ago when the stranger crashed the party. You stuffed all your heads in the sand like a bunch of ostriches at a gay bar hoping you weren't the unlucky fellow who was chosen by Freddie Mercury. This also informs us that most of the people who died and are listed in the Book of Memories died because the rest of them most likely ran away. People who died, like Sadek Burroughs' wife, who was eaten by wolves, while Sadek himself may have been halfway across the Rovanian by the time she was fertilizing trees. Even the stranger is a total moron. If we're correct in believing he is one of the wizards, presumably Gandalf, why the hell does he have an IQ of two? It's bad enough that he murders fireflies when playing elaborate games of charades, but to put the piece of paper with the constellation on it in the fire so he could read it almost made me turn off the episode. After all of that, it is now time for dessert. 
Karen Soup. The previous two episodes made people dislike her like mustard-flavored popsicles, but this episode really takes everything we dislike about Karen Sue and cranks it up to 12. Her and Abercrombie are rescued at sea and gifted dry clothes and food. In response, she immediately demands to be taken to Middle Earth and threatens the royalty and nobles to do it. When asked to stay as a guest after Abercrombie works out a deal, she views herself as a prisoner? When Elendil spawns in out of nowhere and mentions she wouldn't get far in that skiff she's eyeing, Karen Sue, with dagger to his gut, talks down to him like an entitled Instagram model. Oh, but once Elendil speaks a little elvish, her mood switches like she just ate a Snickers. This butchery of Galadriel is hated for all the right reasons. She's almost a complete sociopath by definition. If it wasn't for her attempt to help Abercrombie on the raft right before the lightning struck, she may very well have ate his ass to sustain herself long enough to reach Middle Earth. Not to mention her narcissistic traits, like reacting negatively to criticism and not getting her way, to which she immediately intimidates or even threatens those who do, and speaking down to almost everyone is though she's superior. Almost like she's kind of a supremacist. A fucking ironic. I know that's more of a characteristic of the people who wrote this, but these attributes are still reflected in her. She's the main character we are supposed to be following, trusting, believing in, and inspired by her, yet she has none of those attributes. And she doesn't suffer any consequences for her actions. We've already seen the moment in the trailer where she joins the Numenorians on a ship, presumably to return to Middle-earth, and I can't help but feel that there still won't be any repercussions because she'll convince convince them that Sauron is back, and everything she's done will just be swept under the rug like the CIA selling weapons to drug cartels. Seriously, all the while other characters are going through some form of struggle, Karen Sue is carried on the shoulders of everyone else in this show, like Daenerys being celebrated in Misa. Episode 3 has been a total and utter fucking disaster. Most of the characters are morons, the cultures are bass backwards, the writing, logistics, and consistency have been nuked from orbit. Even the aesthetics still don't look good with poorly executed wire stunts, MCU-level CGI, and good Illuvatar, even the clothing and armor looks like hand-me-down Halloween costumes. Here's another question. Can anyone, without looking them up, hum a single musical theme from this series? No, I didn't think so. We as a fandom and audience already set the bar so low you could trip into acceptance, but man, this show isn't even hitting that. We'll have to see what happens in this next episode. Until then, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.